It's Wednesday, October 19th, 2016, and it's time for Worth Point Chats with Harry Rinker. I'm Greg Watkins, the editor at worthpoint.com, and Harry, uh, you're back home today, aren't you? I am. I'm back in. Yeah, listen, can you tell by the setting? It was a lot more luxurious last week when we did it from the St. Regis in Washington, D.C., I must tell you. I was very jealous. I'm very jealous. Well, you look, you look more in your element today. Well, I am more in my element. In fact, speaking in my element, it was kind of interesting. I, I was in town last last Worth Point chat uh, to attend a meeting of the Sister Stamp Advisory Committee. We've talked about that in the past, that I'm one of 12 people in the United States that advise the Postmaster General on subject matter design of stamps. But afterwards, I was asked by the Hellertown Historical Society. Hellertown is a little town in Pennsylvania, south of Bethlehem that I grew up in come in and do an appraisal clinic and I said well since I had to drive in anyway I could agree to that but I had an extra day and the reason I, I took the extra day was that prior to getting rid of the stuff in the school I had sent I thought a couple of boxes out to a kid to put the stuff on eBay for me and sell it and he were going to split the money right okay. well he lasted less than a week and so the person who has been storing the stuff in their garage has been after me for five years to come and pick it up and get rid of it. So I finally said, okay, I'm coming in and, and I will go through it. Her husband's an auctioneer and I'll just take a few things I want and I'll let him auction the rest of it, right? Right. So I opened the garage door and it wasn't just a few boxes, 20 or 30 boxes worth of stuff. But I wasn't deterred. I wasn't deterred. I said, no, no, I disciplined myself, you know, in the past to go through this stuff and throw it out, right? Because I had no more room in Michigan. I mean, that's the end of it. Michigan is, is filled to the brim. And then I opened the first box and I said, I can't get rid of any of this stuff. Oh, it's all this wonderful paper stuff. I said, put that box in my car. Well, in the end, the table, which had 20 or 30 boxes on, we got that cleaned up. And my car trunk was filled to the brim, and so was the back seat. And I'm thinking, oh, I, this is really awful. Gosh, awful. I don't know what I'm going to do with all, all this stuff. I can't take it in the house. I have no room for it in the house. But I, but I decided to bundle it in their cars, you know, and out of their car trunk. So I could, my car trunk is now a storage facility. But I, I did clean out the back seat of my car. I brought home, all, I think, somewhere between eight and 10,000 postcards, which I now have to sort through and organize. Oh, wow. But I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't let the guy sell them. I couldn't, I mean, it was like, and then, are you ready for this break? We got done. Uh, the, the guy's wife, Dana, used to, is my webmaster, used to work for me. And we got that, and we were so proud of ourselves. You know, there was a big pile of stuff he could take and sell. I, you know, heartbroken though I was, I did leave some things go that I, especially books, but also some historic newspapers and stuff. And we were just getting ready to celebrate, and I turned around 108 degrees, and guess what? No more there boxes. was a floor to ceiling shelf there. And I said, wait a minute, Ray, these boxes with numbers, are, they're part of it too. So I got a, I got about three boxes of that stuff cleared out, but there's at least another dozen bo plus boxes there I have to go back and get again. It's it's like it have it's like it, it must have bred while I was away. Well, you know, was, I, I, like I rabbits. understand how that you know, happens, yes. You no, know, collecting is like it's like owning a rabbit farm. You know, you turn around and you think the pile is only so big at one point, and then somehow magically overnight it, it, it gets bigger. Yeah, like bigger. Trivets, right? I, I guess it is. I don't know. I I don't know how, you know, you know I said, okay, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm 75 now. I had my birthday earlier this month, and I said, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I said, I'm going to learn how to sell them. And I said, wait, wait a minute. I said, I'm going to sell on eBay. I said, I have all the equipment. I have the photograph equipment now, and I can do it. But then I said, wait a minute. Now I have to set up a new business. I have to collect money. I have to ship this stuff. I don't want to go through that. So I thought, well, now maybe I can find somebody that will put it up on eBay for me, and I can cut the deal out here that I was trying to cut with the other person. And I know Will is facing some of the same stuff, too, because he's got a ton of stuff. And he's thinking about trying to get somebody to put it up on eBay, too. That's right. But I don't know. I, you know. I believe he's already contracted with somebody for 100,000 items to post on eBay. Yeah, but the problem is, that, that's okay. But, you know, I'm, I'm, a, 
I have to say one thing, even though I might be a history one of the things that I firmly believe we get this guru status here in mind again is if the antiques and follicles came in as a business, if you don't treat it like a business, you don't get a hit. And therefore, you got to do profit loss, you got to do budget projections, you got to do cost analysis, and so forth. So here I am looking at all this stuff that's worth anywhere from a buck to a couple of bucks a pop, uh, maybe and maybe a hundred dollars in some cases or more. And yet, I'm figuring how much time and effort is it going to take somebody to get this up there, and how much return are you going to get for it, and what's it going to cost to listen? Maybe I can think to myself, I can't get ahead here. At least I think not. But the problem is, there's nowhere else to take it. So I, you remember when I sold the stuff off at the school? I used Kevin Smith of KB Auctions, and he yes. sorted everything through, and he did it all, and I paid him a handsome. I mean, he got more money out of it than I did, but I don't really care because I got rid of the stuff. But the point of the matter, I called Kevin and I said, hey, Kevin, I want to learn how to list stuff on your bid board so I can do it myself. So you just get your standard percentage fee. And he says, Harry, just organize it for me. Just get it somewhere. And we'll, we'll, we'll take care of listing. You pay us a buck of listing. And I said, what? He said, yeah. He said, you know, what we found is that we know what sells and what doesn't sell. And so as a result of all of that, I don't know what I'm going to do, except I can't put anything in my car trunk at the moment. <laughs> well. What are the odds of you finding an elementary school for sale in uh, Michigan? Oh, no, 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 no. Linda keeps talking about getting a bigger house here and a bigger house in Florida. And I know from my past experience that the more room you have, the more shit you have. I mean, there is a direct correlation between room availability and shit piling up. Well, well, okay, I understand that, but you're going to have to get those boxes out of the trunk or you're going to be paying a lot for gas. Well, that is... Either that or I will, my, my, my car will become the new storage shed and I'll get another used car and just leave it out in, in the driveway. That, of course, will not sit well with my neighbors. <laughs> yeah, you can buy, buy a used van. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Well, well, I, mobile yeah. home. Oh, no, I, I don't even want to think of that. Uh, <laughs> but no, it's really, it's, it's really interesting uh, on, on all of that. But anyway, enough of that. Uh, here we are. Uh, oh, we have a couple of, uh, well, we've talked about that. And I wanted to talk about that. You know, it's a, an interesting night. We're up against the World Series and the political debate. Yes. So so we'll have a, a bigger audience tonight. We, we might. You know, I was thinking yes. of all the nights that we might get some audience. And by the way, could someone be watching? There is a chat feature on the side of uh, YouTube that you can you can ask a question in the chat. Now, somebody said they tried it once, had some problems, but I would say persistence counts. Well, the I've other got it thing, open here, so if anybody's going to chat so with us, I'll see. There you go. Then we could we we could we could do that. But anyway, well, I sent you some pictures, and uh, I'll let you pick which one you want to start with here. Okay, we're going to start with uh, this chair. That chair. Now you know here is a chair. Clearly, it must be somewhere around 100 years old. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a desk chair or some kind of an office chair, not a household chair. You can tell that by the form. Actually, you know, when you look at it and you, and you wonder what happened to the old Windsor chairs from the late 18th, early 19th century, this is the late 19th, early 20th century equivalent of, 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 a, of, a, of a comeback Windsor in there you can see the design styles the drop in the front suggested a little east lake pattern it's got a cane seat which you know goes into those late 19th century chairs which didn't follow one particular design motif but combined designs from all over but the interesting thing is let's turn it sideways yeah there you can see that it has some kind of a spring on it right right that allows you to rock back and forth at the desk and, and you know one of the things that is fascinating is movable furniture. Now, normally we associate movable furniture with a civil war because as the vets lost limbs and legs and so forth, they needed furniture that was you know, like recliners and so forth. Actually, historically, uh, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, is a chair that is a recliner with a leg extension to it made in the 18th century that supposedly Lafayette said it when Lafayette was wounded at the Battle of Brandywine, he came up into uh, the hospital, which was in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, was cared for there by the Moravian sisters. Uh, they, they have this play where the one 
sister who is not supposed to fall in love with the outsiders falls in love with Lafayette and then never marries the rest of her life because she uh, the uh, unrequited love and all the rest of that stuff. But that aside, uh, by the time of the Civil War, immediately after, thereafter, we started to get an attempt to make furniture less static and movable. And we saw the first movable pieces at the time of the Civil War, but by the beginning of the 19th century, there was a ton of this stuff. Uh, and, 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 and here is one such apparatus uh, uh, for this. There were uh, the Morris chair with its, with its adjustable back is another example of this. I mean, there were all kinds of attempts to use metal. Now, you know, okay, having said all that, it sounds like this is a scarce scarce chair and, and I mean have I seen another one before probably but I can't remember it when I when I would have done it right by the way changing the subject briefly while we have a chair up here I was reading um, Jane Cleveland's latest Josie Prescott mystery you know I, I love cozy mysteries with antiques and collectibles theme and Jane Ke uh, Cleveland's Josie Prescott series is probably one of my favorites of all favorites and she has a new book coming out in November called Glow of Death Interestingly enough, the main uh, item featured in there is a Tiffany lamp. But she got it, but she knows a lot about the antiques and collectibles read. She tends to write about it. She had a line in there that said, rarity is involved with how many made and scarcity is involved in how many survive. And first of all, this is not a rare chair under her circum. I mean, th those definitions, I'm stewing over those definitions to see if I agree with them or not. But in terms of rarity, this chair is, this is a mass production chair, sold all over. I, I don't think a lot of them survived because it, they weren't very practical and they weren't enemy type. Uh, yeah. Now, the question is who would buy it? Well, you know, certainly you don't have people collecting office chairs. Uh, and yet, on the other hand, this one is unique enough that it belongs in either a local history society or some furniture museum. I mean, I would think it would be something if you took it down to the furniture museum at a high point, they might be interested. Of course, they'd want to donate it, whatever. But the problem is, what is it worth on the open market? Well, my my suspicion is if, if somebody would pay 25 bucks for it, that's a lot. Even though I think it's a neat chair, I wouldn't pay. Well, mm -hmm. I shouldn't say I would never pay. It depends on how it's sat. If it's sat neatly, I might pay 25 bucks for it just because it's novelty. But then again, it would be one more thing I'd have around the house I have no use for. Uh, but what, what do you think, Greg? Well, I it's interesting, and, and I'm, I'm trying to figure it's out the mechanics. That's a, so does it just tip back and forth? Most of my terms in the trade for I don't give a who, no, but it is interesting. <laughs> well, yeah, we know that. Um, but I don't think there's a place for that in my office. No, and that's the problem. Today, today it's all about usability. If you can't use it, who's going to want to buy it? Well, I, I mentioned I was doing an appraisal clinic for the Hell of Town Historical Society. It was really a fascinating one. I must have seen six sets of china, including one Blue Ridge pottery set with with matching glasses. That that. You know, if you put it on a table today, it has so much pizzazz and wow value. It makes the crap from Cracker Barrel and Crate or Crate and Barrel and what's the other one? Not Cracker Barrel, Crate and Barrel and oh, yeah, Pottery Barn. Uh, yeah, right. Pottery it makes their stuff look look, look like total junk. And yet, it's it's not a ceramic pattern, and um, all things being equal, you know. I told the woman, you get 200 bucks for the whole pile, you're lucky. But I have to tell you, it was so good. Not dishwasher safe, which of course was the kiss of death. Then another woman came in and said, oh, I have this wonderful china pattern, and it was. Uh, and she said, I bought it from your Aunt Verna. Now, now, my mother was from a family of 10. The oldest was a boy, the youngest was a boy, and there were eight girls in the middle. And my Aunt Verna was the oldest of the girls. My mother was the second oldest. But she worked for one of those local department stores called Bush and Bull, which had stores in Easton and, and, and Bethlehem. And she ran the China and Stimbury department in the 50s, because I remember when I was living with my grandparents in Bethlehem, and Verna was still at home, and she would go to work at Bush and Bulls. And I remember visiting her down. Now, I should have paid attention. 
what she was doing at the time. Little did I realize I'd have to know. But what was fun about it was that she found a family album that had pictures in it from the 30s. Yeah, from the late 20s, early 30s. And she found some pictures of my mother and she had copies made and gave them to me. Wasn't that neat? Oh, that's nice. No, no, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. Linda always says, you know, you ought to go back to Alberta. You ought to move back east because you're known there and all the rest of the thing. And I said, that's why I don't want to go back home. Too many people know me there. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. No, I like, I like my, my privacy and anonymity out here in Michigan. But that is about to change, unfortunately. Uh, the local art museum is doing a, uh, a um, exhibit called West Michigan Collects. And so the guy called me up and said, hey, I hear you're a collector. I said, well, that's one way to describe me. He said, well, we're doing this exhibit. You have some, something you might like to. I said, sir, come visit me. Allow three hours. He said, we won't look at collections. We will not look at a collection. We will look at collections. Well, we spent about, well, actually, we spent about two hours. And he was overwhelmed. He said, what? What? Here. And it's all, you know, one of the things that collectors love to do is show off their stuff. But it's also fun to see it through somebody else's eyes, not your own eyes. Because what you think is really neat, and, and you know, you're saying, well, here, take this, take this. And, and then he says, wait, what's that piece of pottery over there? I said, oh, that's my collection of German re retro pottery from the 50s. He says, wow, look at those forms, look at those designs. I want that. I said, you want that? I said, I just picked that stuff up for the heck of it. No, 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 he says, that's great stuff. Well, in the end, they're going to take about five or six of my sub-collections out of here for the exhibit. I will not be the only one in the exhibit. And then, unfortunately, they said, we were going to do a panel of collectors and invite you to be on it. But now we're going to ask you to be the featured speaker for the exhibit. So at the end of March next year, why I'm going to make Whoopi in. And guess what they asked me to talk about? How to think like a collector. I said, buddy, you better believe this will be the most hilarious museum lecture you've ever heard in your lifetime. <laughs> well, I can believe I, that. I mean, I mean, I tend not to go to, you know, I don't know what it is about the guys that love the antique and the museum stuff, but they are some of the dullest people up on a lecture stage. I, I mean, I mean, they, they really do put you to sleep. I find some of the subject matter just totally boring. I, I, and I don't know why they can't make it exciting, because they should be passionate like the rest of us are about that stuff don't you think well I, I think maybe that most collectors are introverts and and they lose themselves in their collections and you no. are definitely not in that no, category no. It, you don't collectors think so? are introverts are you yeah. kidding me they're among the most aggressive people i know well okay you know but, stand in front of something a collector wants and tell him he's an introvert you better watch out not get knocked down buddy <laughs> okay, maybe maybe my impression of collectors is, is skewed somehow. <laughs> oh, I, I as they say politely, I beg to differ with you, sir. Uh, well, that's why we have these conversations. That's why we have these collectors is introvert. I'm I just, I, I'm, I'm making a note. I have, I have to write a column about that. Actually, I, I leading up to my uh, 30th anniversary rank rank collectibles column, I'm writing a column called "Hooray for Materialism." As, as, as you know, there is a, a big movement among Mattel that Barbie is too materialistic. That she has too many things, too many dresses, too many houses, too many cars, that, that because of that, the emphasis of young ladies in Barbie has been misdirected. And now Barbie is going to be less materialistic. And I'm thinking, what? First of all, every collector is a materialist. I mean, what we collect has no value. I mean, no functional value. In most cases, it's usually piled in shelves or boxes or displayed somehow. I mean, what is wrong with being a materialist? I mean, when I grew up, I was told, you know, strive to get ahead, make money, make a bigger pile. And I, all my life, now I'm told the pile I made is too big and I shouldn't be so greedy. <laughs> well, the, the thing about Barbie, you know, G.I. Joe used to be, you had the doll, but then you had all the stuff to go with it. So you could put up any event adventure you want 
whether that's he's a right. scuba diver or a jungle explorer or an astronaut. Well, you had to Barbie get all that gear. Has had over 250, 300 careers over time. She's been, she's run for president a few times. If she was running this election, she'd probably she'd get elected. Yeah, she'd win this this time. <laughs> but, but the, but the whole thing about it is that I just think. I, I, we, have we gotten such a point that we tell young people, well, don't worry about making making money. Don't worry about getting ahead. Don't worry about having more than your parents have. Don't don't be driven. Well, if you're not driven, where what are you? How do you how do you advance civilization? Well, you know that you're not being fair to somebody else if you're materialistic. Well, too bad for them. Hooray for me. So I'm going to write a column about collectors as materialists. Okay, well, you write it, and I'll publish it on Worth Point. You will. You will. And people will. will read it. People will read it. And they will come, as the movie said. Um, <laughs> on all of that. Well, enough of this silliness. Again, we, we, we have an inter another interesting I item. I have thing. another interesting item. Here it comes. Yes. This one is a fun one. Uh, here you can see it's it's a wall plaque and pretty good size, too. I, I don't have the sheet in front of me measurement-wise, but it's like... 24 across and maybe 36 high or so. And you see it says skydiving equipment in the tire, uh, strength uh, strength tested. And you look at it and it, it's three dimensional. The parachute and the diver are like pasted on the surface of the, of, of the piece. And it's obviously got some age to it. And, and the first thing you think about is it's gotta be an advertising plot, except for one thing. There is no company out there that does this. There's no company name or anything. There's no mark on the back. And and you would think that you could find examples of it. But when I went up on the Internet, I had trouble finding anything that looked like this. But finally, I did find a similar one for a golf, featuring a golfer and golf clubs with the same kind of thing, equipment and tire, golf equipment tire. And you know what these are? These are these are wall plaques from the 50, late 50s, 60s that were done with a sports team that were meant to hang on a wall as conversation pieces. Now, I've broken my back researching the internet, trying to find anything that remotely resembles this. Uh, and I found the I found the golfing one, which sold at auction. Are you ready for this? For one dollar. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, I can believe that. And, and I think, you know, the thing has got to at least have five to ten bucks of this, because it's good size. You know how you have these little things that, you know, what I call planted in the back of your mind somewhere uh, are, are these ideas. And I would, you know, I have, you know, I have a huge collection of merchant stamp redemption catalogs. And you know what that is, what those are. That's SNH green stamps and plaid stamps and top value stamps. But there were hundreds of companies that did stamps in the late well, the late 40s, 50s, and 60s. And I have over 500 now. I, I have a full run of SNH green stamp and, and top value stamp and blue chip stamps from out in the West Coast and so forth. And these catalogs are, are really extremely important in trying to understand what was available in homes. And they what the, the merchandise was in there, you got them for redeeming the stamp books. You fill up a stamp book and something was, I, I think, my memory says, somewhere in one of those catalogs, I saw these plaques. You could redeem them for stamp books. Now, you, 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 what, did you go on Worth Point, or were the Worthopedia and try to find anything like this? I did. I did, and I, did? I didn't come up with anything. Yeah. Uh, and, there, were, and, <laughs> there was one skydiving sign that sold several times over. It said, if at first you don't succeed, don't skydive. Yes, that's right. But the thing about it is that this is not a one-of-a-kind piece. They must have sold a ton of these. Why didn't, why haven't more survived and, and out there? Now, the answer to that is, well, it's, always, well, it's really rare or scarce. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, I think they didn't survive because, because they were burned and got rid of, that nobody wanted them. And, and the few people that may have tried to sell them on eBay or any other selling site did so poorly, like the guy that put his at auction and got a buck for it, the golfing thing. 
probably said they're not worth even trying to do anything about. And someday we're going to have to, I'm going to have to do a whole article about things you shouldn't bother to sell, but that they're just as worth it. By the way, speaking of being worth things, we would like you to email us with a question about an object that you have. Uh, what you do is you send your question about an object to community at worthpoint.com. There you can see the slide, community at worthpoint.com. Now, please be as provide as much information as you can, size, markings, provenance, the history behind the object. How did you, how did you acquire it? The whole, the whole shoot and match. Uh, the biggest up of all are pictures. And we generally tend not to get too concerned about objects unless we have at least three, four, five pictures. I mean, give us a picture of the overall object, the front and the, if it's a painting or a print, the front and the back, so we can see them. I mean, I get so many people say, oh, I have a painting. And I say, then send me send me a copy of the back and you don't see any stretch or frame. Now they could have a watercolor, which is flat. It would be a, but they say, no, it's an oil painting. And I said, well, it's not in the stretcher. It, well, they, I mean, they did paint oil paintings on boards, but that's not likely either. Anyway, the long and the short of it is, the more pictures you said, the more able we are to do that. Also, if you have a question you'd like us to talk about or pontificate on or do whatever on, uh, you can use that same email address, community at worthpoint.com. We know people are out there watching this stuff, so hey, how about how about uh, sending some ideas uh, out there? By the way, uh, Greg, I inter had an interesting pro problem. You know, you know, I do a weekly radio show called What You Got on Sunday mornings from 8 to 10 Eastern. You can hear it, you can listen to it on your computer, just like you can watch these videos on YouTube on your computer. If you got, you go to the website, www.gcnlive.com. Well, the other week, something came in, and I couldn't resist alluding to the current political election. And, and one candidate in particular will remain nameless. Didn't I get a blistering email back? from one of my listeners saying, I listen to you because you're a politically free show and you need to refrain from. Now, it was before I made a, a crack about the Tea Party and man, I got heck for that too. Now, I got news for you. Political stuff is not, uh, antiques and clinicals are not politically free. Let me tell you why. If you elect a Democrat, a country local opponent, if you look back at the history of Democratic presidents, you will find that during the democratic regimes, the country look, the, the, the rural look is in. Now, that would seem to counter to that, but when the Republicans are in it, life is a more formal style. Seriously, you probably never thought about that. No, I've, yeah. watched, I've watched that for decades. Now, it's not that I vote based on the look I want to come in, be in or out in terms of antiques and collectibles, okay? But theoretically, it, it's there. It's it's the way people look now. Today, you know, you would think, well, if the Republicans, it would be an urban look. Now, governments may carry the rural areas, but they're big city thinkers. But on the other hand, the Democrats, which carry the big urban areas, tend tend to, tend to be folksy country people. And, and and it'll be very interesting to see what impact, if any, the selection is. I I mean, one of the one of the things uh, of the election. Uh, eight years ago was that all of a sudden a lot of politically incorrect collectibles which were correct collected because they were politically incorrect they became politically incorrect if you collected them you follow all that yes yes and that's true by the way all of a sudden the interest in black memorabilia and stuff seemed to stop i mean it stopped but has fallen back significantly actually uh, on the marketplace so is the market what i end with uh one other uh, interesting discussion. I got in, in a discussion the other day with somebody about whether or not the decline in the market has, has reached the bottom. Now, I feel strongly that it has. But he was trying to suggest to me that it's down 60%. Well, off, off the top of 2008, I, my comment is that may be for the high end of the market, but the bottom end of the market is down 70, 80, and 90%. But the the big thing at focus of our argument was: Did I think some of the did I think the categories would recover? And the answer is, 
I think the recession has currently taken some categories so low that they'll never become collectible again, and that we will see the demise of them. In some cases, that may be very good, like Avon bottles. You know, if there is an, ever an Avon bottle collecting craze again, I may drop out of the business. <laughs> well, I, I mean, hey, come on. You have to, you weren't around when Avon bottles were selling in the hundreds of dollars. And the speculation was rampant for the stuff. I mean, forget Beanie Babies and all that other big. I mean, I was around for two, three huge crazes uh, in the past. One was Avon bottles, the other was fruit jars, the other was glass insulators. Now, I'm not going to say anything negative about glass insulators because I have a lot of friends who collect glass insulators and are insulators of glass or ceramic or otherwise. And, and the insulator group is probably one of the finest collector clubs out there, so we'll ignore them. But man, there were times when fruit jars were bank hundred thousand dollar fruit jars, and they theoretically still are. But today, most fruit jars are brought by brides who want to use them at, the, at their wedding to show how sophisticated they are, which I've never quite understood. But you know, all of a sudden, the old twenty-five cent fruit jars were selling for three and five bucks a piece because the wedding magazine were centerpieces on tables. Now, I, I, I'm pleased to say I've never been invited to a fruit jar wedding. <laughs> Nor do I ever hope to attend one either. Well, you know, down here in the South, you can get fruit fruit jars with stems underneath them, so you can have a classy drink. Well, I hate to say what kind of fruit jars you can get down south in the mountains, and they don't have stems on them, Craig. <laughs> well, they do here. They do. I well, they I do. no. So you you can have your red wine in a fruit no, jar no, and you, still no, have it in stem. I'm going to have to acquire one because I've never seen that one before. That's uh, another. That, well, that's a whole other, a whole other discussion about cash from. Uh, uh, well, yeah, and it's yeah. it's a fantasy piece too. So uh, yes, I could say like the old enough. stem fruit jar, huh? Yeah. Well, I what do they put in it? Thunderbird? No, no idea. No. Anyway, <laughs> Thunderbird. I I haven't seen Thunderbird out here. No. Well, here we go. We, we, we got through tonight somewhere between, uh, well, we people who watch this have saved themselves a good half hour of watching the debate. That's that part's fun. And and no matter what you what you say, there it is. That's right. Well, I guess we're, we're done for for this week. We are. And I'm uh, done. I don't know about you. You well, can I'm done talking if you want, yeah, but I'm, 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 I'm going to sign off. So. <laughs> So we're uh, we're set for next Wednesday, right? We've got next Wednesday, no on, on, no travel. Bet. You bet, you bet. Nope, right. nope. I'm going to head for Florida on Thursday, but I'll be back again. All right. Well, then, until next week, Harry, we'll say goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.